Broadcasting live from the Newsmax studio in New York City, here is Steve Malzberg. All right, folks, uh, just how big a victory will the Republicans have in November? And we're, I hate to tell you this, we're edging very quickly towards November. I know there's a long way to go, and politically speaking, it's a lifetime, right? But I, I hate to break this to you also. Another six weeks, the days are going to get shorter. I don't know how that happens or why it happens that way, but it's absolutely true. Uh, all right, anyway, uh, joining us now is John Sides. He is the Monkey Cage uh, blog author for the Washington Post, also a political science professor at George Washington University. And he has been in his lab um, furiously, you know, mixing chemicals and coming up with uh, uh, an amazing uh, political uh, prediction and landscape. Hello, uh, John, how are you? Good. Thanks very much for having me. Well, it's my pleasure. And I, I'll maybe start at the end here. Of course, uh, it would behoove us and behoove all your readers to keep watching uh, your, your blog and your predictions, because as time goes on, um, the accuracy will improve as we know definitively who opponents are and, you know, who winds up where and, and, and what the landscape looks like. Correct? That's right. Okay, all right, so let's talk a little bit about 82% um, chance of winning back the Senate. How do you, uh, I mean, it, it, how do you arrive, uh, it, I guess, uh, uh, Cliff Notes version, how do you arrive at that uh, figure? Sure, we look at Senate elections from 1980 to 2012, and we look at the role of a handful of factors in those races. How popular the president's doing, how well the economy's doing, whether it's a presidential year or a midterm year, and then we look at states and we look at how Democratic or Republican the state is, whether the incumbent's running for re-election, um, and some features of the candidates themselves, in particular their prior political experiences. And based on how those factors explain elections from 80 to 2012, we then make a forecast for 2014 based on where those factors are right now. And when you put those things together, what you have is uh, it's a midterm year. Midterm years aren't typically good for the president's party. The economy is not growing that fast. The president is not that popular. And thus far, Republicans are recruiting some pretty decent, experienced candidates. All of those things put together mean that there is a better than an average chance that Republicans are going to take back the Senate this year. Now, there are, if I'm reading it right, there are eight seats, Democratic seats in the Senate that uh, you predict at this point, uh, Republicans have a better than 50% chance of winning, correct? Yes. And, and I think that, that you, you, I could uh, go through them with you uh, very quickly. South Dakota, West Virginia, Montana, Louisiana, Iowa, Michigan, Arkansas, and, and Alaska. Um, I, and uh, you, know, you rate the percentage uh, of, of each, the, the chance of each one of those seats going uh, Republican. At the top of the list is South Dakota. Sure. Um, it's a conservative Republican state. Uh, it has elected Democrats in the past, obviously. Um, but it's the kind of state where, in a year that's not particularly good for president, for the for a Democratic president, um, and without a Democratic incumbent on the ticket, it's just a hard race for the Democrats to defend. I don't think any of the election forecasters or handicappers think South Dakota is really in reach for, for the Democrats. And West Virginia, you're just about up there as well, uh, almost a 95% chance according to your calculations. And that's, West, Virginia, uh, West Virginia as a state is, has had one of the most rapid transitions from being a Democratic stronghold to a Republican stronghold among the 50 states. And I think, you know, even with uh, potentially you know, decent candidate um, in both parties, it still really is the Republicans' race to lose. Um, Montana is next on your list, 73% uh, uh, chance. Clearly there's, there's good candidates on both sides here too, and Democrats were hopeful that by being able to appoint an interim senator, that would give him a leg up in November. However, our, we looked at all the appointed senators uh, over the past several decades, and we did not find that being appointed a senator gave you much of an advantage. In other words, being an elected incumbent helps a lot, but being appointed, not so much. And so for that reason, I think the, the partisan complexion of Montana being what it is uh, and the midterm year being what it is, that state also leans pretty heavily to the Republicans. Interesting. And then, of course, uh, you go down to uh, Louisiana. Yeah, the same story is going to appear there as well. I think one thing that's working in the Democrats' favor is at least they have an incumbent, 
in that race. But at the same time, because she is perceived to be so vulnerable, the Republicans were able to recruit, you know, a, a, a U.S. representative. Um, Tom Bill Cotton. Cassidy. Yeah, Tom Cotton. Uh, that Cotton's in uh, I'm Arkansas. Arkansas. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Cotton's in Arkansas against Pryor. That's right. Yeah, so yeah, Ca sorry. You know, Cassidy against Landry. Right, and, right, Cassidy. You know, what we find in it is that, you know, basically the higher the level of, of previous elective office you've held, you know, the better you're going to do. And so to get a member of the U.S. House to run is is a very good recruiting success for Republicans. And I think that's what um, is going to make it a, a cool battle for Landry. Plus, she's, you know, she's also swimming upstream in, in, in a deep south state, which, you know, has they, those, those have also been trending to the Republican Party uh, in recent years. And unlike in 2008, she won't have any presidential coattails to ride. Now, interesting, in the next two, Iowa and Michigan, 64% uh, and 57% respectively, um, you, you did talk about how uh, there are th these, um, at first glance, uh, it looks like they're, they're outliers, as I think Chris, uh, Chris Cezilla uh, put it. Yep. Um, uh, they look better in the model for Republicans than conventional wisdom would have you think. Yeah, I think they're, those forecasts, I would say, are the ones where, you know, we're not, not particularly certain about um, a couple of things that we're going to I think things are going to change in Iowa pretty quickly. And that race is going to shift back towards a toss up. Um, one reason is that it looks like whichever Republican candidate gets the nomination, you know, at most, it's going to be someone with state legislative experience. So not the same as a U.S. House member, for example. And our initial look at the fundraising there also suggests that once you put fundraising into the model, which is the next step for us, that race will also shift uh, back to kind of a toss up status. You know, Michigan's an interesting case. It's an open seat race. You've got two, you know, strong candidates on both sides. Um, you know, we right now think that the balance of forces might tilt a little bit in the Republicans' favor. But this is, again, a race that we would expect to see some potential shifts as the campaign goes on, as we are able to start incorporating some of the polling data. And so I would say right now, Iowa and Michigan are interesting outliers, but I wouldn't say they're outliers that we are convinced will stay that way. Right. And then the final two on the list of eight, uh, and it gets down a little uh, lower, just above the 50 percent chance of taking it Republican, uh, Arkansas and Alaska. Again, you know, obviously there's are yet two more red states that Democrats have to compete in. Um, what's working in their favor in those states and why I think those races are much closer to 50-50 is they do have, you know, incumbent candidates that are going to be so sort of well-funded are going to run good campaigns. Clearly in Arkansas, there's a quality challenger in Tom Cotton. It's less clear whether that's going to be the case in Alaska. So I think those races are genuine toss-ups. And at the end of the day, they could go in either direction. All right. Now, uh, let me let me ask you, and again, as you point out, uh, the, the, um, the models uh, will get more accurate as time goes on. Uh, what could happen, do you think, uh, politically speaking, because as I alluded to at the top, uh, it, it is a lifetime of, uh, uh, you know, from now to November in the world of politics. We know that Obamacare isn't going to get any better or change significantly uh, for the Democrats. Uh, we know that uh, what they've been putting forth so far, you know, pay inequality and minimum wage and all that kind of stuff. Uh, when Obama goes around talking about it constantly, his poll numbers are, are, are still low 40s. And the last poll uh, showed that 65 percent of Americans want the next president president to have different policies than Obama does. So that's not resonating. Um, and the Benghazi uh, Select Committee will uh, will be uh, underway uh, shortly, or at least prior to November, certainly. Uh, so do you see anything that we know of that could change the landscape uh, and the model significantly right now? I think the most important thing would be if there were some kind of period of, of, of relatively sustained economic growth. Obviously, we've had two conflicting indicators in the last couple of weeks. One was uh, the first quarter gross domestic product numbers, which were was very, very low. Some people blame that on the fact that it was just such a cold winter and that depressed economic activity to some extent. On the other hand, we had at least a, a decent jobs report um, last week. If there were a string of you know good reports and good economic right. news, perhaps that would give the president's approval numbers a little bit of a lift and put a little bit of a tailwind behind um, some of the Democrats. Let me let me but ask. It, I'm sorry to interrupt. You. I, mean, I think that's that's yeah. going to be a modest benefit at best. Gotcha. You know, even if it comes to pass. We got about a minute and a half left or less. Um, this uh, this Monica Lewinsky uh, telling her story to Vanity Fair. That combined with Benghazi, what does that mean for Hillary Clinton? Do you believe? Um, you know, right now, I don't think that either of those events is going to have a major impact. I mean, and to some extent, the 
Monica Lewinsky's uh, magazine article, it's still so early before the 2016 election or the even the primaries that will start, the campaign that will start in 2015. I don't think she should be that worried about it. You know, Benghazi is clearly an issue that animates a lot of people, um, but those people are mostly Republicans and conservatives that are not, not going to vote for her anyway. So again, like it, it may be an issue that she's going to have to confront and talk about as the campaign gets underway if she decides to run, but I'm not sure it's the kind of issue that's really going to prove to be a significant liability for her with, with you know, persuadable voters or swing voters. Gotcha. All right, John, a pleasure to talk to you, sir. I hope you'll come back. Thank you very much. Thanks again for having me. My pleasure. John Sides, the monkey cage blog author at the Washington Post and professor of political science at George Washington University. Gimme Five is next, right here on The Steve Malzberg Show.